Alright hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be giving you a collection of different node and just general art tips relating to Blender, but we're going to do things in a slightly different format this time. This is going to be a tips compilation video, but also a project breakdown video. I want to see how well these two things gel together, so I'm going to show you through a few of my recent experiments across different projects, and explain a few things which you might find useful for your own artwork. So without further delay, let's get into it. So with the release of Blender 3.1 there are a bunch of new geometry nodes which you can use to do all kinds of new effects with meshes. There were a lot of mesh manipulation ones added which I explained in my recent 3.1 feature video, but one of them in particular I really wanted to play with was the edge angle node. You can see this one here. There are two values in it, unsigned angle and signed angle. Now the interesting thing about this node is that because we can get the angle between faces, we can restrict where things are placed based on the angle. So if you take a look at the statue here, and just for reference this is the Waters Family Grave 3D scanned by Katie Wolf on Sketchfab. It's a really really lovely model and scan and you can download it for yourself as well, so feel free to take a look at that if you're interested. But I like using this one for the demonstration because it's got so many high and low points of geometry and lots of curves, especially as we come around the back here you can see the draping cloth going across the statue. This is a really good place to demonstrate how to place things in between the curvatures of objects. Now the parameter that lets us do this properly is the signed angle value here on the node, which is basically a radian value describing how concave or convex the angle is between a face. So just to demonstrate this better I've come to a clean version of the file here. So we have the statue looking all nice and smooth in the light. If I add the geometry nodes modifier here, what I'm going to do is first of all add a distribute points on faces node. Now I've used this in my other geometry nodes videos as well, but this is also a good point to mention the the uh, point cloud additions to 3.1 where now when we generate points instead of just having like an abstract symbolic representation of where they are in the render view in cycles only you'll be able to see perfect spheres where they're generated so i'm going to add a set point radius node in between here and turn that down to 0.01 then i'm going to put the density of the uh, distribute points on faces up to 10,000, just so we can get like a completely full coverage over the object the reason i'm doing this is because it'll be easy to see how the edge angle node actually restricts their placement so if i make an edge angle node now and then if i plug the signed angle value into the selection input of the distribute points on faces we can see that something happens here we can notice that in the low areas of the mesh, points are disappearing, and this might be easier to see if we actually join the geometry with the original input, so if I make a join geometry node, plug that in here, plug in our set point radius, so that gives us our points, and then the original geometry, and then use that as the output. When we go back here, you can see how we have the original material and the mesh underneath the points. So we're starting to get the effect where we're only having the points occur on the higher areas of the topology. Now I'm going to make these a bit smaller, so let me add another 0, 0.5 to the end of that. So what if we wanted to do the inverse of that? We can see that we have the points going along the high areas, but what if we want them in the low areas? For example, if we were doing dirt buildup, like the point of my experiment. Well, the radian value of a signed angle basically starts at zero and then goes positive or negative up to about, I think, six point something for radian values, which is like, you know, two times pi, but like positive and negative. It doesn't really matter. But all you need to know is that a positive and a negative radian value basically represents a convex and a concave angle. It might be the other way around, but we'll find out very quickly. Because if we make a math node, we can set this to less than and then make the threshold zero if we plug the signed angle in what this is saying is if the angle of the face is less than zero so if the radian value is heading in one direction then we plug that into our selection and now we have the inverse so we know that all the angle value is less than zero I mean it's coming inwards like that whereas if I changed it to greater than it's going to do the opposite. So we can now decide the direction by using a greater than or less than and comparing it to the zero value. You can also slightly modify these values to restrict the placement even more. So I'm holding down shift and click dragging the value there just to make very small changes because radian values are actually quite small numbers. So just keep that in mind. So if we wanted things to only really appear on the very top of the geometry, that's how you would do it. But because we're doing a dirt buildup effect, I'm going to put that down to less than and then change the value appropriately. I'm actually going to do minus 0.1. I think that'll be all right. Okay, so just to adjust some values, I've got the points on 0 0.005. I'm going to move this up to 100,000, which is going to be a bit intense, but that would give us a lot of point content to work with. Okay, so the next tip I want to throw in here is using points for different purposes. So points are a very versatile type of data in geometry nodes. Now that we can actually see them represented in 3D space, it means we can use them for artistic effects. So for example, if I make a set material node and then plug that in here in between the points and the joint geometry, maybe I can give this like my dirt material, which I had pre-prepared. And there we go. This is basic. It's not very realistic, but it's basically a demonstration to show, yes, you can apply materials to point objects and use them artistically. So if you really wanted, you can combine these together and use them as like clumping effects 
which is something I had been experimenting with. And I can show that again in a minute. But like I showed in my generative modeling crash course video, you can also use points to generate other types of mesh content. You see, at the moment, the points are just like virtualized meshes. They're not really real. And that's kind of why their performance is so extremely high when compared to using instance objects. But if I turn our points down to like 50,000 just to uh, increase our performance, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn these into voxelized mesh content, just for anyone that hasn't watched the crash course. So if we make a points to volume node, I'm actually going to slice here to make a node socket. And I'm going to plug our original points in before their radius has been changed, just to see what that looks like. Okay, that's fine. So if I plug the points into our points to volume, now I'm going to make a volume to mesh node so we can convert that volume into actual geometry and then plug that mesh into the socket down there. Okay, the radius is very high, but it has actually generated new geometry. So if I turn the radius on the points to volume down, let's get it something really small, again 0.01, then it's trying to take the point content we've generated and turn that into actual mesh. So let me say increase the density of the voxels, voxel amount 300, we can actually push that higher. Let's do 1000. Okay, that's very intense. That took a while to compute, but you can see here how it's turning the point content into mesh. And if I take my set material now and put that after this, then we're applying the material. So now the shape is less blotchy and less spherical because those points were perfect spheres. And now it's kind of blended together those points. Now I'm going to turn the voxel amount down a little bit to save on performance. So it's not as detailed, but you can still see it working. We can also change the values like the adaptivity and the volume to mesh to change how it tries to blend those points together, which makes a slight difference. It might look a little bit more low poly on high adaptivity values. And then we can do something else where, say, we set shade smooth and we'll put that after our set material. So we know it's going to try and shade smooth this part of the mesh, which will help to hide some of the artifacts along the surface. Now let me put that voxel density back up so we can get a bit more detail. And you can see here how, again, not completely realistic, but we have a kind of muddy effect coming in between the crevices. Okay, so that's a very quick demonstration of using points in two different ways, independently as they are for artistic effect and using them as a data input for creating other effects. Now I've been mentioning performance a bit and another tip which I'm going to show you is again a new feature which was added in Blender 3.1 for geometry nodes and that's the timings values. So we'll actually be able to see how much time it takes to calculate every part of this node tree in Blender. Now I've seen people asking comments, where do we find this timings feature? Well, if you go up to the top right of your node editor window, you see we have the overlay drop down here but we can check the different wire colors we can check the context path choose whether to hide or show the annotations but oh what's this at the bottom timings so if you click that you'll be able to see where the slowest parts of your node trees are so rather understandably for us the things which take the most amount of time are the distributing points on faces because we have such high values and the volume to mesh which takes the volume created from the points and actually turns it into proper geometry so if you want to focus more on optimizing your node trees then that's definitely an important thing to have so we've come back over to my actual demonstration which is a much more advanced version of what we just took a look at again definitely not completely realistic but i thought this was a good experiment to try and push the features and see how they will work together. I guess this brings us to another tip which is layering different effects in geometry nodes. If we take a look at the surface here there are a few different things going on. We have these really high frequency tiny details splotted along the surface. Then we have these much smoother collections of mesh content running along the crevices. Then we have these small stones scattered around. We have little blades of grass as if like a whole clump of mud has just been thrown at the statue with grass intact. And then also we have these little spherical blobs going on. So there's a range of different features going on here and how are they added together? Well let's take a look at the node tree. So I will say I haven't completely cleaned this up and I haven't focused much on efficiency as usual but we can take a look through this sequentially. So at the end of the tree here we of course have the point where everything comes together. We have the group output node where we put our final geometry, we have the joint geometry node where everything comes together and then we have the group input node where we plug the original geometry in. At the top here we have where we're creating the voxel mesh content. So this would be these gatherings of geometry here, which is all blended together in one go using the volume to mesh technique, which we took a look at. There is a disturbance in the thickness of these voxels as they go across the surface. And this is created by having a random thickness of voxels here, which is powered by the noise texture and the color ramp. Another thing to keep in mind with these node trees is that if you have all of your nodes inside of frames, it actually gives us an estimation for the amount of time that everything contained inside of that frame takes to calculate. So you can see that even though we can see those values independently, it's trying to add them all together 
and at the bottom here we can see 1200 milliseconds. Now the generated mesh content is again given the dirt material plugged into the joint geometry and then we come down to the debris and the grass. Now these are pretty much identical frames except that the scale and rotation values are a bit different. What these are doing are taking collections of objects, generating points around the mesh again and then instancing them on those points. The reason why this is duplicated rather than using the same trees is because of these value differences. We're only using 2000 points for the grass but 10,000 for the debris because I want there to be more debris than grass points. There are probably ways you can do this in much fewer nodes, but again, while I'm experimenting, I just like keeping everything exposed and open in different cases. This is actually the same way I do programming work. I'll have a lot of things which could be condensed into one function still separate, just because I know, oh, I might actually want to do extra special cases for those different categories. So included in the techniques of layering things together, if you're conscious about the performance and you want to be able to turn different layers on and off, make sure to use a switch node. What the switch node does is it essentially gives you a tick box to show whether or not you want a layer to be active. So notice for the debris and the grass here, we have the debris geometry going into a switch node, into the true value, and the grass going into a switch node similarly. The switch tick box is a boolean value, which means it's true or false. Now if it's ticked, everything that's gone into the true value is going to be passed to the output. So in this case, it's ticked to say yes, so all of the debris is going to be included in the geometry. Same thing with the grass, it's ticked yes, so the grass geometry is going to be included. But if we untick these, then they'll disappear. So if I untick the debris, after it's calculated, we'll see the stones are gone. Same thing for the grass, if I untick that, now the grass is gone. So that's one thing to keep in mind when compiling your different types of geometry, if you're doing lots of multi-layered effects over a mesh. You'll notice as well that the timings have disappeared from these nodes because they're not being calculated at the moment. Now I'm going to bring the output nodes all the way down so we can take a look and talk about the points again. But actually before we do that, for demonstration, I'm going to add a switch node to our voxel mesh content at the top here because it seems appropriate. So I'm going to add it to the frame. Okay, that's on the false, but I'm going to put it on the true. And because it's disabled there, it means our voxel content should have disappeared. Okay, that's fine. So now all we have remaining are the point effects. So notice that we have points for blotches, which are these collections here, these spherical compacted areas, and that's given some random thickness. And also I can demonstrate this if I change the color of this handle here, you can see how some areas become larger. I'm going to turn that back down. Okay, and then we have the high frequency points, which is for the scattered splots around the surface there. Now, once we finally got those points, I'm joining them together before joining them to the geometry over here. The reason for that is to do with materials. I noticed while I was experimenting with this, and I don't know if it's supposed to be this way, that if I set the materials for these points independently before they were joined, then it wouldn't work. It could only be one or the other. If you did it to both of them, then it would just be plain white. Although I've had inconsistent results with that. So I joined the points together first, then put it afterwards, then did the switch, and then passed it to the final output, which means they can both be given the same material at the same time. So if I give it the same material as the statue here, it'll be harder to see, but you can basically see that it's all blending together there. Now you can use this type of effect for all kinds of interesting creative things. Say if you wanted to do some kind of weird, funny, toxic growth, then maybe I'll set this to something like really hyper out there. Here we go, like some proper green mutated thing going on. But you'll notice there are some extra effects going on. So I'm going to throw in a self-promotion tip here, which is the ambient grunge node. So the reason I've been doing these experiments is because I was testing to see whether I'd be able to add extra features to my ambient grunge package. What the ambient grunge node does is it lets you add procedural dirt effects around an object. It takes a look at the procedural edge and ambient occlusion masks and then decides where to add those dirt effects around the object if I turn off the geometry nodes modifier here, you can see what it looks like just with the grunge node where we have the dirt building up along the edges again. There are all different types of values you can play with on this node to get all sorts of different grungy effects. But yeah, I just thought combining this with geometry nodes might produce some really interesting, powerful procedural dirt build up effects in the future. So before we move on to a different demonstration, I want to give you one more organizational tip for node trees. So I guess one thing you generally want to try and avoid is having really, really long node links from group inputs going like all the way over your tree, making it really hard to read what's going on. This node tree is definitely not perfect, but you'll notice I have multiple instances of the group input node. And this is because the geometry from that input node needs to be used many times. So rather than have it going from one node and just like, you know, cutting across everything to get there, you are perfectly allowed to duplicate the node as many times as you like and use it wherever you want. Another extra thing you can do to save even more space is if you have it selected, you can press Ctrl and H and it will hide all of the unused values. So if we do that here, then we have a very, very small version of the group input node. We can even collapse that and that's still providing the geometry. So that's where you can save even more space if you want to be really considerate about keeping your node groups really tidy and clean. 
So we're going to move on to another demonstration here. This is a piece of artwork I've made recently for, well, quite obviously the Ukrainian conflict. This is quite a heavy project. It takes a long time to resolve the samples, but there are some interesting tips and techniques I used in this, which I want to share with you. So first of all, the character model here was created using the human generator add-on. Now I've already done a comprehensive video about this for when it first came out. So I highly, highly recommend you go and watch that because it's a really, really cool add-on. They're on version three of the add-on now, I believe. So extra features have been added since then. It gives you a wide range of parameters to help you generate different kinds of human bodies. So male and female. There's even like a clothing system and a makeup system and they're rigged at the end as well. There's a collection of poses you can use. Like it's a really, really cool tool. I do have some experience with sculpting humans, but I'm not great at it. I need to do more studies and get better in that department. So I decided to use the add-on for this one. One thing I should say about this artwork is that every part of the materials is procedural except for this cross texture which was painted inside of Blender. So I'll show you how to paint something like this now inside of Blender and what I used it for were for these eye sections here. So if you zoom in it's kind of replaced where the iris would be. We got this glowing cross. The way you would typically do this is if I made a plane and I'm just going to scale it down, rotate it so we can see it. Now primitive objects in Blender are already UV mapped kind of. So if we take a look at the image editor down here, we can imagine that the plane is going to be this entire square. So if I go into edit mode and select the face, you'll see that as I'm enabling and disabling the selection, we can see it's represented in the image editor. Now what I'd want to do, first of all, is make a material for this object. So I'm going to call it a tutorial, why not? And then in the shader editor here, I've got my principal BSDF shader. I'm going to make an image texture node and I'm going to plug the color into the emission value of the principal BSDF shader and the alpha into the alpha value. So now I know that when I do plug a texture into this, is going to be represented properly. It's pink at the moment because we have no texture, but if I gave it the eye mark, you'll see that it's doing the right thing, except that it's not the right color, but it's, it's the perfect color for what we have painted. But to make our own texture, let me remove that from the image texture node. We're gonna go down here to the image editor. I'm gonna press the new image button. I'm gonna call it eye mark two. We're gonna keep it 1024 by 1024 pixels. For the color, let me click on that and turn the alpha value all the way down. We've got alpha ticked, so that'll be considered RGBA. And then let me press okay. So we now have a transparent image here. Now what I'm gonna do is assign the eye mark two texture to our image texture node. So there it goes. Now if we go up to the object mode drop down and choose texture paint, we'll now be able to paint onto our plane in the 3D view and you'll be able to see it represented down here in the image editor. Now obviously you won't be able to see the boundaries um, so that's one thing to keep in mind when you're doing it this way but I would just be able to like you know paint on a cross in 3D space like this and I could kind of keep an eye on the texture down there to see kind of how close I am to the boundaries. Now one thing to keep in mind here is that if you're using the material preview mode or EV you can paint in real time and watch it update in the rendered view. If you're doing it in cycles, you'll still be able to paint on it and see the result, but you'll notice that you won't be able to see the completed output unless you go back to the solid view and then back into the rendered view again. And then let's say you have it as you want it, then we could do some extra node modifications. So say for example, if I go back to the object mode, let me do a mix RGB node, put it in between the color, and then set it to the color mode, factor all the way up, and then set this to like a nice cyan color like that. Then I can turn the emission strength up to something like, you know, 10. And then we have our nice painted glowy texture there. Then you can use this in 3D space however you like. You could shrimp wrap it to other objects, which is what I did with the eye. So if I click on the eye object there, then go to the modifiers. You can see it was a plane that's been subdivided up to a level of five and then it was shrink wrapped onto the eye object. Okay, so for the next effect, I'm going to tell you about these uh, colorful ribbons in the background. If I press Control and B and make a border there, so we're only rendering one section of this. Once this resolves, you better see that there's just a plane which has been rotated going straight from the upper left to bottom right. And the material for this is like a kind of consistent yellow, but there are brighter and lower areas of that yellow going on, which makes it look a bit ribbony. Now, this is actually quite simple. If I take a look at the nodes here, we're taking the object texture coordinate and we're passing it into a node group here called Lions X. Now this is part of my procedural patterns pack, which you can buy, but the Lions X is quite a simple one, so I'm just going to show you the inside of it. We're taking a wave texture set to the X direction, and we're using the color of this as the vector input to a Voronoi texture, and then we're restricting this with the color ramp. What this gives us is a mask of lines, so white on black lines or black on white lines, depending on how you have it set up. And then we can use that to modify other data in the shader nodes. So here we're taking that mask and we're using it to darken yellow. So yellow is our color one, the mask is our color two, and we're essentially, if I scrub this up more, using that mask to darken the areas of the yellow. If the factor is one, so it's completely darkened, we can see those areas in between are completely gone. If we bring it all the way down, we can see we have much more of that yellow remaining. So the 
in-between point of 0.5 is a balance between the two. And the exact same thing applies to the blue ribbon on the other side. All right, so for a slightly more complex shader tip, let's take a look at the body material here. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this material. I have my complex iron node from my modular metals pack, again, a paid package. I'm passing values from this into the ambient grunge, which we mentioned earlier. So that's making up the bulk of our surface body material, which is why we have all these nice shiny reflective details going along the side there. I also have a body paint texture, which was used just for doing like small details like colors under the eyes and stuff. I use that texture to color the base input. And then I also had another texture for painting on emissive details. So using the same technique as we did with the plane, if you have a UV mapped object, you can actually just paint on those emissions if you really want it. But one of the interesting things here is how do you think I got this red splat effect going across the body? The trick here is that I actually recycled the eye mark texture. So the same texture being used on those eyes is used to make this red effect. Now the way that's possible is thanks to our next tip which is to use Voronoi scattering to take segments of images or like full textures and scatter and blend them around an object in a way which makes it look non-repeating. So you see here I have the scatter node, which I've created to set up exactly that effect. Now the way I learned how to do this comes from Jonathan Lampel's video, which is absolutely fantastic. You should definitely give it a watch. It's called something like Instant Procedural Image Scattering in Blender with Voronoi Vector Coordinates. And he made that alongside an add-on which was designed to help you scatter textures just like this. So when I made that, I was like, okay, well, what happens if I just plug the eye mark texture into that? What would that be like if I then recolored it? And we get this exact effect here. So if I turn down the recolor, you can see that it's just white instead. Now you could use this for all kinds of things. So if you wanted to have like a painterly effect, you know, where you had like paint splotches randomly splatted along an object, that would work fine. I guess if you really wanted, you could use this to make like a modern art generator. I'm sure people would make all kinds of NFTs off of that. But anyway, yeah, that was an interesting technique I wanted to play with. But another thing you might notice is that this red splattering effect kind of disappears as it moves up the body. So how was this done? Well, here's another tip, and that's using the window texture coordinates to restrict the placement of a material in relation to the window or the camera if you like. So I have a texture coordinate node here. I've plugged that vector into the vector rotate. You can copy down my values if you want to do it the same way. This was mostly found for experimentation. So the center is 100 and the axis is 001. Angle 133, one, you can change that however you like. The angle will basically decide the rotational angle for how it's distributed. And then the color ramp here will decide how far up or down the body it goes. So if you look carefully in that noise, as I bring the white closer to the black, you can see it go further up the body there. So it's kind of like a rudimentary way of just restricting on a gradient where those shader effects are placed. So because the shader for this red effect is different from the actual base shader, the way these are blended together is using a mixed shader node. So we have the base material for the body being the first shader, the red shader being the second one. And what I'm doing is I'm taking that window vector gradient from the color ramp using that as color one. I'm then taking the alpha value of the eye mark and using that as color two. So what I'm essentially doing is designing a new mask and then passing that as the factor value for the shaders. So we know that the red shader is only going to be apparent where the eye mark texture is being scattered around the body. All right, well, I think we've covered quite a lot in this video, actually. I didn't really feel like doing step-by-step -step breakdowns for each of these experiments. I just wanted to kind of show you what I've been working on in case you might find it useful. Please let me know if you did. So one thing I do in my videos is that when we start to reach the end, I provide an emoji for the video which you can then put in the comments so I know that you made it this far. I think for this video we'll do the paintbrush emoji or the palette. I don't really mind which one. I just think it's quite appropriate since a lot of the content in this video was material based. So yeah, leave it below so I can see that you made it this far. Don't forget to check out curtishold.online forward slash store for all different kinds of add-ons and resources. You can sign up to my Patreon if you want to help support my work. You can even join our Discord server to take part in discussions, share your work, and take part in art challenges. The current challenge is circular. It's a shape challenge. I like doing different types of colors and shape challenges to let people flex their creative muscles with a kind of vague term. The uh, top three winners are given a permanent place on my website as well. In terms of products, I highly recommend you check out my modular metals pack and the Generators Lab content pack for the Biogen add-on, which will help you do all kinds of weird generative modeling artwork in Blender. I should have another community creations video coming out sometime soon, and oh my word, this community just does not stop producing amazing content. There's so much to talk about. Anyway, thanks for watching, stay safe, and I will see you next time.